Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Fullest Podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Boswick. Today's guest is Nicole Granado, who is a holistic nutritionist and women's health specialist who specializes in hormonal imbalances, PCOS, adrenal fatigue, eating disorders, and much more. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming all the way to me. It's so, it's just such a special treat to be with someone in person and we haven't seen each other in a while. And I think this is just so fun because we've known each other through the years Yeah. and like my business has changed a lot since we met and your, you know, our lives have changed a lot. You're a mom now and you have an amazing, amazing little boy and a wonderful husband. And I'm so excited to catch up and just kind of like also share about everything that you're up to. Amazing. I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. So I kind of want to start with like back when you kind of got into wellness Um, I know that PCOS is definitely something that got you in it. I'm curious, though, because um, I know that you come from a family who's very conscious and like you have this amazing background where have you've never been vaccinated, right? No, that's so (laughs) awesome. And so you've never been vaccinated. Did you you were homeschooled? Mm -hmm. I'm sure that also kind of meant that you ate pretty well. Yep. So how does, you know, if that's what your belief, you and I have the same belief system that food is medicine. I'm curious, how did PCOS come into play? Obviously, we, you know, I know that there's so many other factors that contribute to, um, you know, different diseases or different challenges that Mm. we go through health-wise. So what do you think happened there? I think as like any teenager would like I had a certain upbringing that was super conscious and um definitely had um a lot of benefits into like my life and my body in general and also just in the way in which I approached certain things but I did have a phase when I was like 17 where I was like I'm gonna just rebel against everything yeah and it only lasted a year because <laughs> I was like I don't like this actually um and I and in that year I had taken birth control because I was like I don't want to get pregnant. And I almost think it was like everybody was doing it. So I was like, maybe I should do it. But I remember the one thing is, is I had a doctor that was like, you should get on birth control because it's like the the safest thing you can do as a woman to protect yourself from cancer. Oh, interesting. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll do it because I was like a little bit paranoid about that kind of stuff. For sure. um, They. Where did you grow up? I grew up in New York. Okay. Yeah. And so, and so I, I went on the birth control and I kind of had this year rebelling. And I honestly think that that's what gave me the PCOS. And I kind of have this like perspective that a lot of the PCOS is connected to the stuff we're putting in our bodies. And yeah. may it be like the, the ingredients that are inside vaccinations to like what's inside birth control and all of these different hormones that I think it's a, it's a, it's a, like a, uh, an effect of all of that kind of stuff. I totally agree. And I think that my upbringing and where my body was as like a young adult is what, what is why I was able to combat it so easily and so quickly in combination with everything that I was doing because now I have clients that didn't have my upbringing but have like amazing health results within just like three months mm-hmm. of like completely changing their lives just through making lifestyle changes. Um, Will you define what PCOS is? So polycystic ovarian syndrome is basically a disorder, a hormonal disorder, but um, it's when women develop cysts on their ovaries. And um, so that's interesting. Actually, my sister just found out she had a cyst and then she found out she was pregnant Yeah. at the same time. But it was like she has a seven centimeter fatty cyst. Mm-hmm. So is, P- is PCOS... Is it like it could be fatty or fluid? Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, And they always say that you can't get pregnant or it's very hard to get pregnant with PCOS. But like, I just don't think that's true. Yeah. I've seen so many people get pregnant with it. Um, And I, and I've actually kind of seen and like people's bodies just kind of naturally rid themselves of it. It's almost like phases. And I think that 
I don't know if they're necessarily super, I don't know if they're necessarily bad in a sense that like if you have it, like that's it. You have PCOS, there's this mentality that like once you get diagnosed with it, there, since there's no medical cure, you'll have it forever. Interesting. And I went through that because when I had PCOS, um, I went back to my doctor to get checked like three months after I started doing my own protocol. And I asked for my ovaries to be checked and I had no more cysts. I had seven cysts on my ovaries. Whoa. And my doctor was like, no, you still have PCOS. And I was like, well, how is that? Like, that doesn't make sense because I don't have any cysts. It isn't <laughs> polycystic ovary syndrome. Like the main, the main reason, the main thing is like that you have cysts on your ovaries. <laughs> And he's like, no, because there's no cure for it. Like, you can never get rid of the disease. I'm like, but I don't have cysts. So wouldn't I just have a hormonal imbalance then? Because that's... Yeah. And they were just like, he he couldn't, like, yeah. meet me there. Um, that's so interesting. My, yeah. Well, my sister, who, when she found out that mm. she had... So she, her baby was a centimeter when she found out and then the cyst was seven centimeters and she literally just told me this morning, which is so interesting yeah. that you're saying this, her cyst went down to two centimeters. Wow. So like yeah. you're saying it just, your body yeah. can do it. Yeah. They either like some of them just dissolve, they get so small or like some women say that their cysts just fall out of them. Whoa. Like, like that can, happened to me. Like you can see it. Yeah. Like Whoa. you can see it in your underwear. That's crazy. Yeah, it's pretty wild, actually. Yeah, it happens to a couple of people. And just your body ridding it of ridding like ridding itself of something that doesn't serve it. Wow. So yeah. what's so then from there you kind of had a protocol that you Yeah. So from there I went to another doctor. I went to two other doctors and I basically didn't bring any of my health records. And I was like, um, oh, I just want to get checked. Um my hormones and um, get, check my ovaries. I've heard of this thing called PCOS. I'm wondering if like I show any signs of it. Um, both of them said no. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So one doctor diagnosed me with it and was like, you're always going to have this. You need to go on birth control and stay on the drugs, which I never took anyway. But like, and the other doc, two doctors without seeing his history, were just like, no, you show no signs of it. I was like, so there's something really fundamentally really wrong here. Yeah. And so that's when I decided to start putting together my protocol and what I did. And then that's when I started working with other women as a nutritionist, because a lot of most of my work is all based on nutrition and lifestyle changes and like a few herbs. Um, and just by bringing more awareness to intuitive eating and like how we treat our body and how we think about like everything and in, in, as a whole. And, um, and then, yeah, and then I've been doing it for like six years now. I know. I mean, yeah. I remember because I started Poppy and Seed mm -hmm. in 2014. Yep. And you were doing, what was it called? Did you call it something? No, it was just my name. Yeah. It's yeah. always been your Nicole name. Brown. Oh my yeah, gosh. it's always been my name. And I think, I don't know how we connected, but it's so crazy. I don't crazy. remember. I think I had, I don't know, maybe I had a publicist at one point in yeah. the beginning who had us meet, but it Aww. was like, I think it was like right before you were married yeah before it was all that way 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 yeah so it's fun to kind of watch each other grow and see I how know. it all unfolds but so during all this you also started a um like self-care yeah. line for so women I had willow which was yeah um which, oh my God, I've been talking to my husband about bringing her back. I, I think I'm going to bring her back in a different way, but I started Willow because I wanted um, to bring, I did a lot of like my own studying on like body image and sexuality and how that connects into um, wellness and how we take care of ourselves and the image that we have of ourselves. And um, I feel like sexuality is something that's really not tapped into or discussed mm -hmm. as young women, um, and it's obviously so different when you become a mother, but, um, yeah, as young women. And so I've noticed like when I would talk to a lot of friends that I've known for a while, like you would talk about sex and it would always be so like everyone could talk about sex, but then the minute that you talked about your vagina, it was like, Oh, like, I don't want to know that. I don't want to hear about that. And you're like, yeah. all these things that we think are so, um, we've been conditioned to think are like, oh, private or, or menstruating or anything really. Um, and so I started this 
line called Willow Feminine Oil, which was meant to be just like a self-care vaginal oil, mm-hmm. um, which, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people loved it. I still get emails about it. Like, can They're you like, please, please bring, bring it, back? it back? I mean, and then the mist. Uh, yeah. And, and you ha- mist. did you have tea? We had tea and it was just a hormone tea. Yeah. Yeah. A really relaxing hormone tea. So that, that all will bring, we'll be bringing back through the project that my husband and I are working on right now. So um, fun. But... But yeah, I love I love those. So how did you meet your husband? Because he's Australian. He's Australian. So and we... I love his accent. I know. <laughs> how did like what? He's the where best. Did... I I forgot. I mean, when I just saw him, I was like, oh yeah, I totally saw you guys at the market mm-hmm. that we had, and you were already married. No. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Wait, we were. Yeah, we got married. <laughs> we got married like six months after we met. Um, so we That's met. That's so cute. And I know we met, and um, we we met through mutual friends, and um, and you moved to Joshua Tree together. Yeah. Okay. Well, we met through mutual friends in LA. He was working in London. Um, what does he do? He's an engineer. Okay. So he was working on like offshore. Um, building and he works for uh, like um, solar <laughs> oh, cool. windmills in the ocean. Oh wow! So I'm blanking right now, <laughs> but anyway, so he works on he works in those projects. He was working offshore in Norway on this construction site, and then in between there in London, and he was visiting friends in LA, and I went to their house. And it wasn't like a setup or anything, and I had this my friend's baby in my arms. And he walked into the their airstream. They were putting getting it together because they were like doing a whole summer airstream adventure with their kids. Fun. And I just saw him and I like threw the baby at him and I was like, <laughs> here. And I was like, I ran out and I was like, oh my God. And I just got all blustered. And then we spent the night hanging out and um he and then we we, you know, I went home. And we saw each other one more time on that weekend, but it was so brief. Um, and then we didn't like we we didn't see each other again. And like two weeks later, um, he thought I was dating someone else, which I wasn't. But, oh, but that was what he thought. And so we hadn't talked. And then I wrote him a message. He responded to one of my Instagram posts. I wrote him a message. I was like, we need to talk about the night we met. Wow. So you <laughs> were like, like, I'm just going to. That's literally all I said. And I was like walking into Erewhon to get a salad. Like I was totally in another world. And I was like, I'm just going to write this. Yeah. Um, and we talked every single day since. And we spent seven weeks talking every single day on the phone. Because he went he back away. to London. Yeah. And he was working offshore. And so I couldn't see him. And so we talked every single day. Like, we had never even kissed. Wow. And so we fell in love before we even, like, kissed each other, basically. Aww. And had this really... And which was amazing. Um, and then I went to visit him. And our first kiss was in the airport. Wow. And then I spent two weeks with him. And then we did another six weeks apart. And then he came here for two weeks. And we did another six weeks apart. And then while he was away for that time, I was like his project was done and he had to move out of London anyway because his visa was up and I was like why don't you just come to America let's see what happens and then we're married wow yeah so he was able to come what was it like for him to come here like how long did he stay here when he came he stayed so we weren't sure if he was gonna stay um full time or what was gonna happen so he just came as like a visit and then we got married and then we went through like a green card process. And then when... Do you need to get vaccinated to get a green card or a visa? You do. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. so yeah. So that's, so that was kind of like our hurdle that we, we had to decide. Um, and so basically we, um, you know, we, we were going through the green card process and then we moved to Joshua Tree in that time because I owned a house before I met him. I remember you were like, mm-hmm. you, yeah, you moved out of LA and has, have that beautiful home there that you yeah, designed. Exactly. And so, um, we, yeah. And so we, we, we moved to Joshua Tree and we found these two horses the weekend that we moved. Aww. We were driving by a race, track breeding farm or yeah a race track breeding farm and I was just like oh let's go and I grew up with horses so I was like oh let's go in and let's just see them I just want to pet some horses I haven't seen them in a while so we walked in and we walked into this farm that was just so sad and we were like what the hell did we just walk into and I was like I need to find who's running this place and 
finally found the guy after like trying to speak Spanish to like everybody. <laughs> I was like, I was like trying to like get through everybody. I was like Google translating and I was like, anyway, I found the guy and he's like, yeah, we um, breed uh, race horses. And I was like, oh, and I just played dumb. I was like, oh, like, do you sell to other people? Like, we're interested, whatever. And he's like, no, but I have one I need to get rid of. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, I'll take a look at him. And he brought us to who is now called Baby Chief. Aww. And he brought us to his uh, stall. And he was just, like, butt turned to the back, like, facing a wall, like, staring dead at it. I had been in that stall for seven months. <gasps> And was so skinny and had like cuts on his body because they they were like they tried to train him for racing but he's like he's not a horse he's not a racehorse Whoa. that horse is not I mean <laughs> taking him on a trail ride is a challenge like he is not he is not the guy that races or walks very yeah. much so he had like this big cut on his back because I think that's where they were hitting him to yeah. try and get race so they like kind of like broke like one of his or did something to one of his bones he has this like indent in his on his butt and his spine sad so we saw him and my husband was just like we can't just leave him here like we have to take him and I was like yeah so we're like we'll take him so, so like most couples get a dog together <laughs> and you guys got a horse yeah. <laughs> and so we got him and then we were heading north to the pacific northwest Long story short, we were coming back. My husband built their whole paddock oh in the Joshua gosh. Tree. I was going every day to see Chief. And then he's like, oh, I have a mare coming off the racetrack tomorrow. If you want her, you can have her. We're getting rid of her. So they just gave the horses to you? Yeah. So I went what? and I was like, okay, well, I'll take a look at her. And I got there right before this other guy went there because he wanted her to harvest her eggs. <gasps> and then they would put her down. So basically what they do to all the mares oh my God. is they take them, they breed. If they can't use them, they like breed them, breed them, breed them. And then they sell them to vet veterinarians, believe it or not, who take their, continue taking their eggs and then they put them down. Why do the veterinarians continue? Because to... they sell their embryos. Oh my god. So gosh. like our mare was like a fifty thousand dollar horse and they would they would sell the embryos. Like I just came across a mare last week that we're thinking about taking. Um, but I'll that'll, I'll tell you more about that later. But like they um, each one of her babies sold for seventy five thousand dollars. And then they just get they just dispose of them. So I saw her come off the trailer and I was like, which one is she? Cause there was two horses and they're like that one. And I was like, that's the horse. She's a fucking goddess queen. Wow. Like she is, <gasps> whew, she's my, like, she's that's my so soul. Cool. And I was like, I didn't even tell Khan. I was just, I just like, I'll take her. And yeah. he's like, well, I have another guy come. I was like, listen, I will give you more than he gives you. Like, I'm literally not like, you're not, that's not happening. Like, yeah. I'll give you the money right now. Wow. So he's like $500 and he gave her to me. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Okay. So what happened to the horses when you were in London then? So right now the horses are in Northern California. They're at this um, sanctuary, this like farm called the Flag Ranch Sanctuary and so they're on 90 acres and they joined a herd of 50 horses and they're Whoa. just like running the hills <gasps> they're having free so much fun and like living their best life we're gonna see them in two weeks and so that that'll be the trip where i'll decide if i bring them home or if i leave Let, them there yeah. um I that's just hard yeah, yeah it's hard because chloe you have finn and yeah. you have so much going on well we're gonna have more horses wow we've already rescued one last week Oh my gosh. Yeah. So they'll, they'll, we're going to have horses no matter what, but in Joshua Tree, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of if we bring back or. This episode is brought to you by Clean Cult. Clean Cult makes non toxic natural cleaners that actually clean with ingredients you can actually understand. They're redefining cleaning up your home and the planet with shatter resistant, refillable glass bottles, and their natural formulas are packaged in 100% recyclable milk cartons. We're partnering with them to offer you 25% off your first order. So go to cleancult.com forward slash the fullest to place your order. That's spelled C-L-E-A-N-C-U-L-T dot com slash the fullest. 
So I when quit. you got pregnant, mm-hmm. I remember like we were kind of messaging back and forth and you were in Mexico. You went to Mexico, right? No, or... we went to, um, we were in Joshua Tree. We went, we went from Joshua Tree right to London. Oh, you did? I don't yeah. know why I thought for a little bit you were in Mexico, but no. Joshua Tree, Mexico, very different. But for some <laughs> reason in my mind, my mom brain mind, I was like, oh, she's having so much fun in Mexico City. I don't know why. And then, okay, so you went to London. Did you ever think you'd be in Australia? Like, yeah. are you close with your parents? Were they, is this their first grandchild? So, are yeah. they bummed that you weren't near uh, them? I mean, I think me and my husband are both happy that we weren't near our family. Yeah. No, I mean, I think it's <laughs> cool. Like, you like set your own, yeah. you know, life I don't think up. we, either one of us wanted to be near our family. So that, I mean, that was great. I think the hard part was for us to be away from our community yeah. and our friends. Um, but when we got pregnant, we basically, I never wanted to have a baby in America because the vaccine laws scare me. Yeah. And I didn't have health insurance when I got pregnant. Um, and when I got pregnant, I, I was like, that. I need health insurance. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just like put my money into preventative medicine. Yeah. It's just kind of where I feel, you know, I have it's catastrophic insurance, but like, I think. I'm yeah, fine. exactly. Um, but so I called to get health insurance. And they were like, sorry, you don't qualify. What? And I was like. Because I'm, you were already pregnant? Yeah. I was <gasps> like, I'm well, they're like, you need to wait for open enrollment. And I was like, well, open enrollment's like end of December. Or whatever the hell it was. I don't even know. I still don't know. I still don't have health insurance. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm pregnant. Like, I need to go get my tests. I need to get all this stuff. And they're like, yeah, no, sorry. They read me off a list of, like, quali- qualify, like people that would qualify. And getting out of prison would qualify for health insurance. But being pregnant doesn't. And the best part is, is that if I have a baby outside of open enrollment, I basically, that baby would have to be viable for 48 hours that's how they that's what they how they called it for 48 hours before they would consider it a life that's insane yeah because i consider it a life as soon as you like literally insane so i went and i just remember just like bawling because i was like i can't have a baby in this fucking country like and i definitely know that i'm very privileged to be able to say that yeah like I'm, I'm aware of that, but like for me having that option, I was like, I need to take that as an opportunity. And then right around that time, um, my husband's job offered, offered him his job back. And, uh, and so they were like, yeah, we have a project we want you to work on. It was in London. And so we were just like, you know what, There's, let, like, let's just go and let's just have Finn and um, did you think you would end up there or you knew that it was just kind of like a well I was always period. like I will never move to London mm-hmm. oh you always said yeah, that I was oh, like told Khan and so Khan when when that decision came up he was like you have to be the one to to make it like I'll do whatever Aww. you want but like I'm not making this decision for us because this like you're pregnant like you're about to go through this massive transition like you need what you need and yeah this has to be your decision so amazing that he gave me that to like make the decision but also at the same time I was like (laughs) I know why me (laughs) yeah um and so yeah and so I was like you know what like it's one year and uh we were planning to go to Australia after that year and then COVID happened and we basically had Finn like three weeks before we went into lockdown. Hold on. I wait, how pregnant were you when you went there? Five and a half months. Wow. That's a big decision. Five and a half months pregnant. It was huge. And we were flying with our dog and you can't fly with dogs on the plane to London. So we had to fly into Paris and then from Paris, stay two nights, get our dog, his passport, get in a car (gasps) and drive to London to bring our dog five and a half months pregnant. I didn't like, know that. Oh, yeah. It was really intense. And we, like, moved into this house that there was, like, no furniture. And so we got into this empty house. We've completely built our, like, little home and furnished it and everything. And so I'm, like, seven months pregnant still putting this house together. Oh, my gosh. But I'm so happy that we did it because, like, A, perspective and B, I mean, my birth there would have 
I mean, I don't even know. Like, to get midwives and I was having a home birth and everything, like, the government completely supports it. So I had midwives that were paid for by the government. That's That amazing. literally I called and they would just come over whenever I needed. All my checkups were completely free. All my blood work. Everything. everything. I have not one bill for Are my you birth. serious? And I ended up having to go into the birth center. Um and I had Finn in the birthing center because I was in labor for 40 hours. And when I got to like about 30, hour 36, I was so tired and in so much pain that I was like um, pain from the labor. Like I hate saying pain because I hate, I don't want that to scare people. I loved giving birth. Like I yeah, can't wait to do it but again. But it was very, but it, like <laughs> yeah, in, it is. in the labor part, it's just like. It's gnarly. And I said to Khan, I was like, if. I like get so tired. I, I I need to feel like I'm there, and if I need help, I can get help. And luckily, when I got there, I like ended up becoming like more dilated, and he came really quickly. So you didn't end up getting any. No, that's awesome. And then um, he, but when he was born, he like took a big breath because he had his cord around his neck, and oh then he stopped breathing. <gasps> so they snipped him from me really quickly, which is like I'm quite sad about still, but. Um, Because I think he would have continued breathing. I think he just needed a minute. Yeah. But it was amazing because they snipped him and she called the code. And within, I'm not joking, like six seconds, there was maybe 10 doctors that pounded through the room. And everyone came just in case. So everybody who was needed, who could have been needed, was was there. there. Instead of being like, oh, we have one emergency. Oh, you have to call for that person. They get there in three minutes. Like Everyone is ready on standby. And so whoever, and so whoever wasn't needed left. Wow. And it was like, and he ended up breathing in like a second and it was totally fine. But I hemorrhaged after birth because when he, um, when he was born, like, and he got taken away, like I kind of got out of the pool and they wanted to give me the Pitocin to get the placenta out. And I was like, fuck that. I'll get it out. And I just pulled. Oh my gosh. I love that. (laughs) I was like, I have adrenaline in my veins. Why would I need your Pitocin to get this placenta? (laughs) Yeah. But then it made me hemorrhage. So I was there for six hours after and still nothing nothing i was like hooked up to medication for it like got all of his checks everything and then the best part was is they're like great we're gonna like here are the vaccines that we want to give you um were you already prepared like you knew what their protocol was to say no to or like because in the u.s you have to sign off beforehand no 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 you can do it on the spot i was more open to the vitamin k before I did more reading on Me it. Me too. Like, I, I was like, I'm never going to do anything. Vitamin K, maybe. Yeah. And then, and then, yeah. yeah. And I was like, you know, um, yeah, I was more open to it. But now when I, when I then, when I like kind of went in and I um, had him, I, I was just like, no. I was like, the idea, the idea just made me feel weird. And so they wanted to do like the hep B, which I don't get. Like, yeah, no offense, but my kid's not going to go shooting up heroin on the street corner. Like, yeah. I don't think he needs a hepatitis B shot in his like five hour old little tiny body. I know. So, but I said no. And they were all like, oh, can you tell us why? And I was like, I just don't believe that he needs it. And like, that's just my belief. And they respected it. Like they were totally cool. respectful of it. Um, I didn't have to have any like arguments or fights. They were a little bit more pushy about the vitamin K because they really don't believe that they have enough vitamin K. But your breast milk has all of that. I mean, and I can't get behind the reality that like the placenta doesn't provide the baby with vitamin K for survival out of the womb. Like I honestly don't think in the medical world that we value and respect the placenta enough. I know. Yeah. I actually kept my, my, I didn't even know, Con kept my placenta Aww. and put it in the freezer. And before we left Cold? London, he dehydrated it for me because I was like, I can't, well, actually, I'm wondering where it is. He dehydrated right it for now. you? Yeah. That's amazing. Oh, shit, I totally forgot to take out. We have Airbnb guests. I hope they don't. <laughs> it's in the freezer. I just, That's I just so remembered. Funny. They're going to be I like, are these out. people organ harvesters? 
<laughs> well, he like cut it into strips. Oh. He did a little like, prayer oh. over it. And then he cut it into strips and he put it in the dehydrator and it was dehydrating in our house for like two days. That's amazing. So it smells, I heard, when it does that. Yeah. I mean, because I had mine, but I like got mine prepared and dehydrated, but then I took it a couple times. Mm. I took two capsules and then I was like, this doesn't make me feel good. So I stopped taking it. So I've heard that sometimes that can happen and it's good to take like later on. So it's cool that you have it. Yeah. For later. Or yeah. even when you go through menopause. So I have a tincture from yeah. when I go through menopause. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you can do with it after it's been dehydrated. So we were thinking about doing it. This is like planting a tree. So Khan's parents Aww. planted his placenta, planted a tree for him and then planted his placenta underneath it. And it's a eucalyptus tree, and eucalyptus what? trees are like my favorite trees. What are the odds that you met <laughs> another guy in LA? How did that happen? And that did that conversation come up in the beginning? Yeah, yeah. It it was like pretty. We've always with Con and I, like we've always been super aligned. Like people never understood how we could spend so much time. We spend every day together, mm-hmm. all day together. Like, yeah. and people, and we, and we faced a lot of judgment for it actually from really close people, from the people that actually introduced us. Oh, interesting. Um, just of like how our relationship kind of began, but we were, we were so aligned as people and like in every way possible that it, it just like worked. <laughs> And, like, from the beginning, like, our conversations were about, like, you know, how we were raised and, like, what our belief systems are and, like, how we want to raise children and, like, how we just approach everything in life. And so it was pretty wild. I mean, to have at this day and age to, like, fall in love with somebody over video. I used to call it video time. I understand it's FaceTime. (laughs) FaceTime and, like the phone where you're left for seven weeks to just use words and talk. It's you're so not nice. like going out and getting distracted or like all these things. Like you're actually spending that time. And we would talk for like four or five hours a day. Wow. I don't even know what we talked about. Well, I also love that you knew, I mean, obviously you're in this world and like you, you were both raised a certain way, but you both knew you didn't want to vaccinate mm-hmm. and you had these conversations like, not circumcision you know mm-hmm. all these things did all of those things come up before you yeah. got married too because these are things that most couples navigate once they're married and once they're you know yeah. pregnant and then yeah. they're like oh shoot we're not on the same page this yeah. sucks yeah yeah and yeah it's interesting because I yeah all of this like and I find it interesting that that conversation doesn't come up more and it makes me think like that nobody really knows how to communicate because oh, it's like sure. how can you not have those conversations well like, I also think that people don't know yeah. to make like people don't think about circumcision they're just like it's like at the hot it's like I bet even they don't even think about it until they get to the hospital have their baby <laughs> and then they're like do you want to circumcise look my it's son so is not sad. circumcised yeah and I I can't understand how I know anybody could do that. I mean, no judgment, but like, I don't know. I just, yeah, especially like I made that skin. Like, I don't want someone to just cut it off and take it and like, and make that decision for for your child. And I, and I actually asked my brother, my younger brother, who's now in his twenties. And I was like, are you mad that our mom circumcised you? Cause my mom circumcised him. She did. And he was like, actually, yeah, like, I feel like it's really fucked up. Like that, like that was my body. Yeah. (laughs) Like that wasn't her body. And, you know, there's a lot of like other issues he has with her, but like, so I think it fueled some of the other stuff, but like in a whole, in a whole sense, it's like, that's like, he's, I, I don't think that we as mothers are taught to like understand that even though there are children and they depend on us, that they are their own people. Yeah. And so in parenting as well, like we never read a parenting book. We never read any, like we have read zero books on anything. We were never like, we want to learn how to raise or take care of a baby. We were like, we're going to listen to what he needs yeah. because if I'm going to read a book and I'm going to try and learn how to take care of a child, 
that's assuming that everybody's the same and everybody's so different. There's so many parenting books and everyone has like so many different philosophies. And I think about that all the time. Like, and you could just get a book and then be like, well, that's what this person said. So it must be true. Yeah. Like I've read so many books where it's like, um, I mean, I haven't read it, but I've read about all these different philosophies that people are like, oh, apparently there's like a counting method where you like count things down. It's like 10, nine, eight. Mm-hmm. And it's like, obviously the way that I am, I, I'm not doing that. And so I was thinking, wow, what if my husband just randomly found, found a book on Amazon that was recommended to him and bought it? Cause that happens all the time. And then you like read this and you find it, you believe that it's truth. Mm. And then you never trust your own intuition or trust how your child, I mean, your child and my child are going to be completely different. Totally. Because they're just like, they have their own way. Like my son doesn't want to get dressed (laughs) at all anymore. He wants to be (laughs) naked. He wants to sleep naked. He wants to be naked. And like, I, I don't know. There's just so many different ways people would deal with that. Right. So I think it's really cool that, you know, there are people that want to go back to like trusting their intuition and seeing what totally they, yeah and people will say to us like because finn he's like the ha- he's always happy and he never has freakouts. like Aww. he never has and yet meltdowns and is like i i mean he never cries like he's so never sweet. upset and it's because like i see when he's frustrated with something and i like watch and be like okay he's frustrated he sometimes he gets frustrated with his own limitations like he wants to do something but he can't yet yeah so you like help him try and do it or like i know that there's certain things that he like you know he just like he loves people he loves exploring he loves doing things so i make sure that like i pay attention to things that he loves and like I instead of when he's frustrated ignoring him I like help him Mm -hmm. and so he never gets that point where he needs to like freak out and express that he's not being heard or he's not being seen or like any of these things so I I feel like that's made a huge difference yeah because yeah it's I mean it's been what did you do about pacifier never did it I love it he we were like firm like not gonna do it and then he came out of the womb always sucking his thumb like he was always sucking his thumb and so we just encouraged that for him to use yeah. like self-soothe and so when he was like about to fall asleep or whatever he'll just put his thumb in his mouth and then he'll Aww. just kind of like drop his hand out of it that's so <laughs> sweet yeah so you know we never did it. i mean there's so much research to show that um it's not good for their jaws that's what and I as well heard. like my friend was saying like I kind of feel like it's a silencer like I'm silencing I that's my how child. I always felt was yeah. like oh you're sad I'm gonna shove this in your yeah. mouth so yeah. that you you know stop yeah. crying and that's a, the like the way in which like when if he does like have a if he like falls and he has a cry or whatever like we've always been really conscious about our words so We'll never be like, oh, don't cry. Yeah. Or like, oh, no, you shouldn't cry. Or like distract him with something. We'll like hug him and hold him and like let him process and cry. And like if and then he finishes in like a couple of seconds or whatever. And then he like kind of moves on. But we never wanted to be like telling him not to express or when he's like like, shushing. Yeah. Or like when he's wild. Yeah. Because he's wild he has a lot of energy we're never like you're crazy we always use the word wild so yeah, like yeah. substituting certain things to like i make totally it more. agree i i've really noticed okay so like we have a little play group here at the office as you know and um i'm i'm typically around non-vaccinated kids like that's just how it has been for us and i like we have some kids that are vaccinated that are part of the play group and that are all the same age. And like the ones that aren't vaccinated are geniuses. Like, I'm not kidding. They speak in full sentences. They're just like happy. They're, they're just like completely different yeah. than the ones that are, who do not speak, who like their demeanors, just everything about them. Like they're silent. Yeah. And, um, so that's what I was going to say that reminded me of it is like, 
And uh, going back to like when Truth was Finn's age, like at eight months and stuff, a friend of mine, a couple friends of mine have eight month old babies and like one of them, you like can't ignore them in the room. You know how sometimes like yeah. there's a baby and obviously, obviously they're like, you know, sometimes really quiet and people could just like totally forget about them. But when they're awake and aware, like they're so engaging. Yeah. And the ones that are vaccinated aren't. Yeah. And it's so crazy because I already feel like I knew this, but to watch it go down is yeah. a totally different thing. Well, there is a doctor that I posted about, um, forgetting his name. He's out of New York and he has been a pediatrician for 20 years and he's, he is fighting for, um, people to have the right to vaccinate their children. Yeah. And, um, he basically said in one family, I've seen a family that has had three children, the first child fully vaccinated, the second one, half the third, nothing. And in that family, you see a massive, massive, massive difference between all three children. The first two are always sick, have some sort of like disorder, have consistently been coming in. The third one is like completely different child, super healthy, super strong. And I mean, I, I, I think that like it's, it's not a, a super scary yeah. topic for a lot of people because I think whenever you start challenging the conditionings and what we're conditioned to believe and obviously safety because everyone's trying to make the best decision based on like what how to keep yourself and your family safe so it's very triggering and challenging but I think that one thing that my husband and I always say is like we're not anti-vaccine we're anti what's put in them yeah and for sure being able to choose, like we have a privilege to be able to choose because there were vaccines and there are vaccines in the world. They play a role in society and they play an important role or they played an important role. But when we're putting all of these like neurotoxins and aluminum and mercury and all these things that we're asked and told to stay away from them and scientifically proven to cause huge detrimental effect, effects on us. And then we're injecting them into little tiny children like when we're not thinking because we're thinking that doctors are telling us it's safe and people are, and science is telling us it's safe, but it's like, we don't ask any more questions because we're just conditioned to believe those sources. I, I always say, I'm like, what about all those parents that lost children? Or what about all those children that have died or all those children that like have huge, huge, huge effects that are going to affect the rest of their life? What if that was your child? And if it's not your child, you're very lucky but like, are you okay with it being somebody else's child? Yeah. And now what if like you make a decision that you feel is best and you feel it's best to vaccinate your child? That's amazing. But what if you didn't have that choice and there are vaccines that made you feel safe or completely taken from you? How would you live like every single day, the fear that you would live for your child's life? That's what people who choose that vac not vaccinating their children, that's what they're feeling. And then the most important one is like, if the vaccines work, then why does it matter? Isn't the point of it to protect against the virus? So why would you want to risk putting all those things into your child if you didn't have an actual safe protection? I know. <laughs> like, none of it makes sense. I don't sense. get it. Like, if you add it up, it's common sense. I, I think that's so important. If it works, why do you care what yeah. I do? You know, but, and I think... I think for me right now with like the elections coming up, it's an interesting topic because I'm like, had COVID not happened, I probably wouldn't have the political views that I have now yep. because of, even though like medical freedom was threatened prior to COVID, it just like heightened everything and it made it so people live in fear. And when people live in fear, they make really interesting decisions and like they could like for example even with a mask like if I'm not I've had multiple people come up to me I was at the park the other day there was absolutely no one at the park just me my friend and my baby and a woman comes out of nowhere I'm still inside the park and there's like literally a gate around us she's like totally way farther than six feet away from me. And she's just walking through the, um, not even through the park, like around it, um, to get somewhere else and sit. And she yelled at me because I wasn't wearing a mask. 
but there's no one in the park with me. Or like I was, you know, dropping something off really quick at the post office and the post office by my house doesn't require a mask. And I literally got yelled at by someone and my son and I got yelled at and he was so frightened that he ran outside and I was terrified he was going to run towards the street. And we just like ran out there and she treated us, treated us so poorly. And it was all because of how fearful she was because of the media. Um, and it's just interesting now because I'm like, I, I have friends that are like, so do you think that Donald Trump actually cares about all of these things? Cause I'm like, no, I, I don't think he cares about all of these things. I don't think he cares about like the fact that there's 5g everywhere. I think that he's for 5g. I think that there are so many topics that I totally disagree, but the one topic that I care about is medical freedom. Yeah. And I know for a fact that, I mean, there are two topics I care about medical freedom and the environment because I 100% want a world where my children will be able to live. And I want, I care about the earth, even if I didn't have children. Yeah. And so those are different, but we're taught to believe that like the environment is like only the left cares about the environment. Yeah. That's what we're conditioned to believe. And it, it's interesting. I'm so curious at what your husband would think about this documentary, Planet of the Humans. It's a Michael Moore documentary. Oh, he'd probably love it. And it's like all about and like just the way we've approached climate change yeah. um, over the last decade and how it's interesting. Just our renewable energy um, market is actually not as as good for the environment as we thought, which is so crazy to me because I'm like hundred percent buy into all of it. And I think no matter what, at least we're trying to like do something about it. Mm. And I think that's kind of the argument is like, if one side denounces it, like that doesn't help us. But I wish that these topics or like medical freedom and the climate, I wish that people came to the agreement that these were actually bipartisan topics and not what like red, or left versus right. Yeah. Because it's like, I think that if we're talking about medical freedom, we're talking about my body, my choice. Yeah. And so like, obviously then it comes down to everything. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm, I'm with you on that. Cause I'm just like, I think that medical freedom right now and the threat against like, I, that is one thing that I've always agreed on when it came to this discussion about Trump versus Biden or left yeah. versus right is like, I think the threat on losing the choice of what to do with your body is so big. And I think that that right now it's being heightened, but it's like, I was saying to somebody, I was like, do you believe that you have a right to have an abortion? Or do you believe that you have a right to do anything to your body? And are you in the streets marching for women's rights? But like, this is, a human right that's being yeah. threatened and, and we're, and we're threatening it and we're supporting it for the fear of a virus that like, it, <laughs> that I mean, the fireman down the street from my house totally. literally told me is not even as like as dangerous in terms of all the calls they've gone as the flu. I like, got COVID crazy. in December. Oh my God. When I was pregnant. My wow. husband got it basically at the same time in London. I got it in London when I, I thought it was the flu. Was it shitty? It was super shitty. Like I did not feel good. I almost got, I was afraid I was going to get pneumonia. I almost got pneumonia. I put herbs in a bowl of hot water. I put my head over it when my like throat was like, my chest was killing me and I was just breathing it in. I took my vitamin C. I did all my things and I got through it. My dad has got, everyone in my family has basically gotten it. My oh dad's yeah, because they're in New York. York. Yeah, everyone's almost gotten, gotten it. My dad was like, I'm not going to the hospital because if I go to the hospital, I'm going to die. Yeah. Like that's the, it's that, like that's medical the mentality. Malpractice. Yeah, and I was afraid to go to the hospital because I didn't want them to put me as a high risk pregnancy, even though we didn't know it was COVID. I just thought because I was sick. <gasps> so I didn't want to like risk have, not having my home birth. Um, but that was in December. Like, I personally believe that this virus has been around since like September of last year. For sure. And I yeah. think that like everyone that I know was like, oh, I had the worst flu this year. 
And I think that it's been around for a long time. And I think that I was, I, I had this like, was so frustrated today because there's like seeing all these people in LA, it's very different. In London, we were never forced to wear masks. I know. And I don't think people here know that. No. I mean, in London, like, okay, the numbers of London are bad right now, right? It's like 17,000 cases a day, but the deaths are hardly anything. So like, are we scared to get sick or are we scared to die? Because we're always going to get sick. There's yeah. always going to be a new virus. There's always going to be a new flu. And we get an update. Our totally. body gets an update. And I think that what would have been really smart was like, hey, if you feel afraid for your life, if you are immunocompromised, if you live with someone who's immunocompromised, wear a mask. And if people don't respect the space of people wearing masks, that should be a violation of something and yeah. those people should get punished. But then now everyone's wearing a mask because they are su- kind of supposed to, they're not really sure. So we don't actually know who's actually in danger and who's actually really scared because now everyone's wearing a mask and I'm not wearing a mask on the street. I'm not going to wear a mask in public. For me in London, if I saw somebody with a mask on, it would be so rare. I would make the effort to go across the street, not because I was worried, but because I wanted to make them feel respected. Yeah. And that's what should have happened in this country because now, like, you don't actually know who's sick. And so now if you have a difference of opinion, which, thank God, we all, like, there's a difference of opinion here, but, like then you don't know who you need to protect because I think more people would care about protecting the people that really need it than not. Yeah, I totally agree. I just, I just don't get it. Like it's, it's, it's mind boggling. I, I think the conversation around like, you don't wear a mask, so you're racist is, I mean, there's people that say that. And I think yeah. that I obviously get why they're saying that because we have a vulnerable population who happens to be predominantly black, predominantly a minority population that's that's dying from it. But like if you talk about healthcare and you talk about the shitty healthcare that our minority population is getting, rather than like, okay, you're pregnant, you take you do herbal steam and take like vitamin C and some supplements. Like that's what people say is like, well, people don't have enough money to buy supplements. And it's like, let's talk about how much that healthcare actually costs. Let's talk about how much it actually costs to go to the hospital. Totally. And get that care. Totally. And like, it's just so interesting to me because also like, I want to take it a step back and talk about like culturally, there are so many traditions that different cultures have that we've like totally steered away from that. Like, these are things that are inexpensive. Like we bring these remedies from all different parts of the world. We bring turmeric, we bring, you know, our herbs and spices that all these different cultures use that are inexpensive that have been their medicine. But because of our, um, the way our society has been and the, because of like people not giving, not being educated enough to be educated on the fact that alternative medicine can be healing. And like, yeah. then they kind of like, we've stripped that away from all these different people that have immigrated here. Like I see it firsthand. Like I see um, my family, you know, my yeah. extended family that has come here and like, they're still like super Persian. So they have all these things, but they've, they've like stepped away from what all our culture says is like healing foods and stuff. And they're just like going to, you know, I'll just take it. My mom loves this. I'll take a Z pack because I'm about to come down on something. Yeah. So I'm just going to take an antibiotic to prevent it. So her preventative care has yeah. become an antibiotic. And that's yeah. like, that's the problem. And yeah. the, our minority population that's the problem because they are, they have comorbidities because of their lifestyle, because, because of the way that we live and the way we take care of them. And that's fucking racist to me, not the, not wearing a mask. Like it's racist that we don't support these alternative preventative healing modalities for people. It's not covered by insurance. I like, I honestly didn't even know that you're considered racist if you didn't wear a mask by some yeah. people because I got to a point where I like the QAnon thing. Like yeah. I've been accused of being a QAnon supporter because I posted something about a little girl that was trafficked and used for sex. Oh and, my God. and because I cared about that, 
oh, well, you know, a QAnon thinks da da da, and so, and so you should check your facts. And like, if we're going to politicize the fact that a little girl was raped and filmed, and that's going to now, you're going to take the severity from that incident and make it political. At that point, it broke me. I was like, when there is something that I can't stand, I'm not even going to learn. So I <laughs> probably heard that, but I was like, I'm not even going to engage and give that attention because it's so fucking insane. I know. I know. Like I, I had I, that I same. I actually can't even. Yeah. I had that same thing just having Dr. Christian Northrup on and people were literally messaging me, you better take that down. You yeah. need to take this podcast down because you're, and we didn't even talk about any of that. Yeah. But just because I had her on. I'm like, what about the fact that Oprah called her one of the top 100 visionary leaders? Yeah. Like, so you don't make any sense. Like, obviously she is an amazing Dartmouth trained medical professional and she has so yeah. many like reasons why she's qualified to speak on what she speaks on. But just because I don't know. And I find that interesting too, is as soon as your views don't align, as soon as, soon as like, yeah, as soon as someone's views don't align, then that person is not credible. Yeah. Because they don't align with what you think is true. And instead, like when I hear something that is not what I thought was true, like even if I, I'm, I'm never going to change my perspective on it, I still listen because I'm like, let me understand. Because I'm a person that likes to understand things. And I, I feel I try to be as like level and like considerate to everyone's use as possible where I'm like, I could see your point. Like, like right now, the like with politically, like Biden versus Trump, I get why people are going to vote for Trump. I know more people voting for Trump than I know more people voting for Biden. I get it. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think that that's going to be the way I'm going to go. Yeah. I don't think that I, for me personally, it's not going to be, but I can understand and respect people that are going to do that. Yeah. Never in a million years thought I would say that. I know I was, I say this a lot. I was curled up in a ball when Trump got elected. Cause yeah. I thought that I was going to be put in a concentration camp because the media like basically made me feel like, because I come, my parents are from a Muslim country and because this is my, you know, my lineage or whatever, that this is what was going to happen under his presidency. And yeah. like, that's when I like shut off. You know, and the in television. some senses, it is what's happened in his presidency. Yeah, right? like for what sure. The with immigration, that he's made. with like the kids, for sure. But I also think that like there's just I I think that there's so much more to learn outside of yeah. what we're told. And a hundred percent, like ICE, the situation with ICE, like and the children it's, and being a mom and like understanding that it's it just changes. so horrifying. So but it's much. also just like, this is an issue our country has had since forever. It, yeah. He made the kids come in, you know, it's hit under his presidency that these babies yeah. are being detained, but yeah. it's been an issue for yeah. way longer than him. And I think that like, I think it's all interesting. I don't know. I, it's I just, think, I think, yeah. I mean, I, I think like, I think, I think when you go back into the history of this country, there's been a lot of things fundamentally wrong. And I think like it shows the fact that he became president, how fundamentally wrong it is because he, he's even like our president at this moment. Exactly. It's just yeah. like, yeah, a lot of shit was wrong before him for, exactly. for that to even for happen. For that to happen. Um, but I, I think that like, I think where the biggest and my husband and I had a discussion about this before is like, you know, the media is to me the scariest of everything because you can't trust anything. I like know. whenever I hear something that somebody said, like if I hear an article about something Biden said that people are like freaking out about, I go and I watch the press conference and it's not what he said. I know. If I hear something about what Trump said that everyone's freaking out about, I watch his press conference and it's, and you, and not to be like, Oh, I like them or, Oh, I support this person over that just to continue to prove to myself how untrustworthy the media is because totally. that sentence isn't what they're saying that it is. I know. And that's what's made it break down. I've literally taken off all news channels. I don't, I don't watch it. I haven't yeah. watched it in like two months. I think it's so good. I, I think you made a really good point because I've even like 
everything, even with COVID, like going to what the doctors are actually saying, the press conference, the doctors are having versus asking the media, everything goes back to what's the actual source saying, not like a derivative of the source. And I think that's just like a really good practice for us. And I think that's really cool that we're in a time where we're learning this and we teach our kids that and we... We're just like breeding different people, yeah, you know, totally. and it's super fun. But, um, in terms of the human trafficking thing, it's like so wild that that issue has been politicized and so much. I actually just went to a talk with Tim Ballard. Who, I'm <laughs> yeah. I like him. can't believe I met him. Like yeah. he is amazing. Yeah. And, um, if anyone hasn't watched operation Toussaint, that's like a documentary on him and his life. And, um, he is the founder CEO of OUR Operation Underground Railroad. Um, and he's basically a real life superhero where he yeah. full on like goes in and saves kids that are and women that are being trafficked. Yeah. Um, but like learning about it is interesting. Like for like I think it's really important to say I live in Orange County and like recently there have been a lot of moms talking about how um Orange County is on high alert. Um, be careful when you go to Target and Whole Foods because there have been a lot of kidnappings or attempted kidnappings and people are working in twos and there's like this whole story. And there are a lot of pedophiles and they're targeting Orange County and it's been like terrifying. And um, I go to this talk, Tim Ballard's there and the head of social services for Orange County mm. is there. And she was like, it's complete bullshit. It's not real. In Orange County, they don't need to come kidnap your kid. All they need to do is find a broken kid on the street, which there's plenty of them, offer them McDonald's and shelter, and they've got them. Like, we don't, in the United States, specifically in Southern California, in Orange County, the way you traffic a kid isn't by kidnapping. The rest of the world, yeah. But, like, when we think of these, like, extravagant ways that people traffic kids, we, like, do a disservice to, like, the whole process. And I and I just want to bring that up because you mentioned it, that, like, yeah. I think everyone should look into this issue of human trafficking because there are 2 million children that are slaves and they are as young as, like, two years old, infants. even younger. Yeah, infants. Infants. I literally it's like, watched a talk about saying that, like, infants are it's used. so disgusting and like okay it kind of goes back to the circumcision thing so I'm I just think it's so wild because and this is like kind of a theory it, uh, my theory kind of goes into it but like basically Tim Ballard says in the documentary and he says this in person but he's like every single time he's caught someone yeah like and whatever they're going to jail and they like interview him they, um, and I say him because it's predominantly men doing it to women. Um, they basically, he says the story is the same. They started with a playboy. They, um, when they were younger and then they like got into porn and then like they couldn't, you know, get that same feeling. So they kept going younger and younger and younger to the point where they just like, that's the only thing that could get them off because they're so desensitized and it's so disgusting and it's so wrong. And like, I think like, this is obviously, you know, my theory. And like, I've I've been talking about this with some of my friends, but it's like when we, um, remove the foreskin on a little boy's penis, when they're born, it's completely desensitizing them. They're taking out all of their nerves, nerve endings which is like at the tip of your penis and like you're basically making it more difficult to feel pleasure. And I a hundred percent believe that there's some, like some way that that's connected because it starts there. It starts with like, for example, I have this doctor who's super holistic and I love him so much and he's my family doctor and he believes in circumcising. And, um, he's like, you're gonna, your son is gonna have, um, what's it called? Like premature ejaculation and stuff like that. And he's going to get into it prematurely. And it's like, well, it's just seen as, so that automatically is seen as a bad thing right away instead of trying to holistically teach our children. Okay. Like this is, you know, who cares when they, when they recognize that 
they can make themselves feel good. Yeah. You I know? mean, my husband isn't circumcised yeah. and he never had any issues. So yeah. Like- <laughs> it's so interesting. It's so interesting. You know, like he remembers being, you know, I, don't, I mean, I've, I've actually only seen, I think one circumcised penis wow. in my life. I've actually never really. And I remember it, it was, I like, I prefer uncircumcised penis. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Just so everyone knows, I think you nice heard it on the full list. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I think it's just important to talk about and bring up so that it, these are topics that someone who yeah. might not be pregnant, might not be in a relationship, might not be having a baby, but they're like, oh, that's like something I could even think about right now. Yeah, totally. I can make my own decision on it. So I just love making it a little more normal too, because yeah. I don't feel like anybody really talks about it. And it's like, oh, okay yeah there's nothing wrong with it I just yeah I'm so happy that you came and um you shared with us a little bit about what you're up to and the way that you are raising Finn and and just you know the trajectory of how things are going with you guys because I really value your opinion I love everything you have to say and it's been really fun following along so thanks for coming and sharing with us you're so welcome I'm yeah. excited to see what you do next. Yeah, we're just, we're in Joshua. I'm actually going to do, um, I'm actually working right now on doing, um, I'm going to be rehabilitating horses. So and Joshua, cool. we're building out a, um, a luxury wellness retreats in Joshua Tree. Wow. Yeah, and I'm going to be doing offerings with um, holistic horsemanship. So like helping, like basically heal horses that are in need that's Um, so beautiful and then teaching people how to like properly connect with them and like heal through them and bringing it all back around with the same herbs that we would use as people we can use to heal horses that's so cool and heal animals so yeah so that's what we're kind of working on so you'll see more about it yeah so follow nicole along on instagram that's probably the best place right Mm -hmm. yeah nicole granado at nicole granado yeah Thanks, Nicole. You're welcome.